Kia ora and good evening and welcome to the welcome back to Fast Forward. It's a pleasure to have you here again for the third in our, our winter series. Um, my name, for those people who don't know who I am, is Dr. Lee Beatty. I'm the Deputy Head of the School of Architecture and Planning here at the University and Director of our Urban Design Programme. We're very honoured today to have um, the Honourable Phil Twyford, the Minister for Urban Development, who's going to talk, us, talk to us about the urban, upcoming Urban Development Act and, the, and how this impacts on the urban growth agenda for the city. Phil has a long and distinguished political career, I'm sure, as we all know. He's a proud Aucklander and also a, a member of Parliament for Te Atatū and an alumni and graduate of the university. So it's really a pleasure to have you here, Phil. I really appreciate you taking the time to come along and talk to us. And again, thanks for coming back to your old university and helping us out again. So it's great to have you here. We're all looking forward to having listened to you talk. And as we heard from the last couple of uh, Fast Forward's um, presentations, Phil's quite happy to take questions for the floor. So please use the chat function. And what we'll do is we'll have about a 25, 30 minute presentation from Phil. Then I might just ask a few questions as the chair and then I'll take questions from the floor, which we've got about 30 minutes of space. So it's really good. So it's a good opportunity for you to sit and have a chat and ask the minister some questions. So without further ado, thanks again, Phil. I really appreciate the time and um, I'll pass the floor over to you and, uh, and then we'll go into some Q and A if that's all right with you. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Lee. Um, and thank you to the uh, School of Architecture and Planning for this opportunity. Um, I always uh, love talking with people about uh, urban development and the future of our cities. And uh, I've been looking forward to this evening. Um, so what I'm, I'm going to do is talk about um, the urban development bill that's before the parliament right now and uh, will be passed in the next few weeks into law. Uh, and then I, I also want to talk a little bit about the broader urban agenda that the government has and and uh, and talk about some of the things that we've been doing in, in uh, other areas as well. So first I think that the um, the question that we have to really address is um, you know why is our government the first government uh, in New Zealand to have a Minister of Urban Development and and develop a whole reform agenda uh, around our cities. Um, and I, and I suppose uh, uh, allied to that is the question, you know, why are cities and, and why is urban development important to New Zealand right now? We've got a lot of other things on our plate, <laughs> people will have noticed. Um, so where do cities fit in to all that? The answer, I think, uh, to both those questions is simply because our cities are not doing very well. Um, they are not performing as they should. Uh, and we can see that the evidence is, is right in front of us on a daily basis. Um, Auckland is perhaps the most egregious example, but there are many others uh, where our cities, <clears throat> which are small by international standards, and yet they really struggle with urban mobility. Their transport networks are not working properly, and they suffer often chronic traffic congestion. And that's a, a really good indication that um, things aren't working as well as they should. We also have had, and we for the, the last decade really, and, and even before we've been in the grip of a housing crisis, where we have failed as a society to decently and properly house uh, too many of our people. Housing is too expensive, it's in short supply, uh, it's treated as a, like an investment commodity instead of uh, a great place to live. Uh, and we're, we're pouring vast amounts of our national wealth into buying and selling houses rather than actually generating real prosperity. And the third point really is that uh, particularly Auckland uh, amongst our cities suffers from uh, low productivity. Given Auckland's size uh, and proportion uh, within our, our country, it should be doing a lot better in terms of productivity and my argument uh, to you tonight is that the failure to address the challenges in the built environment, particularly around transport and housing and good urban planning, are one of the reasons why Auckland's productivity is lower than it should be. Transport and housing costs have risen very quickly over the last decade in Auckland uh, in a way that we haven't seen in any other of the comparable Australasian cities. So that's, the, that's my problem definition. Um, uh, but we should be doing so much better. You know, cities all around the world are engines of growth and productivity uh, and magnets for investment and talent. Um, 
if our cities aren't working properly, then we need to do um, something about it. We need to lift our game. And so our government has developed a, um, what we call our urban growth agenda. And I'll talk a bit about the different uh, parts of that agenda this evening. It's, an, it's designed to, in the first instance, get government to lift its game for us to do better and to contribute to much better, more prosperous and thriving uh, cities. We want to reform the planning system and the way that we fund and finance the infrastructure that allows our cities to grow. And we want to create an environment where all of the other actors, the private sector, the design professions, local government, iwi, uh, and the broader community can all contribute to this vision of thriving and prosperous and sustainable cities. So I'll come back to those other elements in the urban growth agenda uh, a little later, but I wanted to talk a bit more uh, tonight about the urban development bill that is currently before the parliament. Now, um, urban development uh, authorities, UDAs, they're sometimes called, um, but basically, you know, purpose designed public entities um, to facilitate urban development or urban regeneration. They've been part of the landscape internationally for much of the 20th century. And in Australia, since the Whitlam years and in the, in the um, early to mid 1970s, they've been a feature of the, the larger Australian state capitals. But New Zealand has been rather late to the party. And the reason I think is that our cities uh, just haven't been big enough or growth rates fast enough to force us to confront the quite tricky challenges of second generation urban growth. The first generation of uh, growth for our cities was really a, a sort of what I call a kind of mid 20th century or early 20th century pattern of development based around the private uh, car and motorways and low rise suburban expansion. Um, but when cities reach a certain scale, spatial economics mean that um, land gets more expensive when you have more people together, particularly in the center of cities. And it means that we must use land and the market drives us really to use land um, more efficiently. Hence the drive for urban intensification, particularly in places where, you know, where people want to live and that might be access to jobs or amenities. Now transport also becomes more of a challenge. We have to move more people with fewer vehicles. Hence the need uh, now for more walking and cycling infrastructure, for uh, better public transport, for rapid transit uh, networks. Uh, but also we need to meet the demand of people to live close to where the jobs are and where the amenities are. Again, it, it, it takes us back to this um, drive for urban intensification. Now, there have been some examples of publicly led urban development projects or urban regeneration projects in New Zealand. And I thought I'd just mention a few of them. And they're all things that we can learn lessons from. Um, you know, uh, back in the 1960s, the Holyoke government uh, land banked hundreds of hectares of land on Auckland's North Shore to build a new city, a new university in a new city in Albany. And um, this was the vision of a planned community to assist the city's um, expansion. Unfortunately, in the early 90s, the national government of the day and, and Murray McCulley was the Minister of Housing, sold off that land with a sweetheart mortgage deal to a Singapore-based company. And the vision of a, of a, uh, of a planned mixed-use development in a new city was lost. And the Albany that we have today is sadly a result of that. There are some happier stories though. Um, Hobsonville Point, which was started under the Clark government um, in response to really trying to address Auckland's growing pains and housing pressures, um, was overseen by a subsidiary of Housing New Zealand called the Hobsonville Land Company. And um, while Labour has always complained that John Key as Prime Minister stripped out most of the affordable housing and all the state housing, there's no question that Hobsonville Point has been in many ways 
um, commercially successful, and it has demonstrated a new way of, do, of building whole new communities. Um, the old Waitakere city in New Lynn made a pretty decent stab, I think, at a transit-oriented development in New Lynn by undergrounding the railway tracks with a um, cut and cover trench and, a, and a zoning for urban re regeneration in the town centre, investing in civic amenity and um, allowing for uh, high-rise apartments and the like. Both Wynyard Quarter and um, the Wellington Waterfront, I think, are really good examples of local government uh, repurposing and regenerating old portland and turning it into a pretty fabulous um, public space and also commercial and, and retail space and residential um, that we can point to. And the other, I think, really other, other really good example was Auckland Council's work at the Britomart, which a generation ago, I remember as a youngster, was a pretty dodgy and awful and decrepit part of downtown Auckland. And now it's a, uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, neighbourhood. What we want to do is learn from those exercises and, and, and attempts at urban development <clears throat> and scale up what we're doing to do more, to do it faster and to do it better. And that's the vision that underpins the creation of Kainga Ora, our government's housing and urban development uh, agency. It's a kind of delivery agency, a bit like NZTA, Waka Kotahi is for, for transport. Um, Kainga Ora is our delivery agency for the urban, for urban development and the built environment. And we also want to partner with others, with the private sector, with iwi and local government, uh, and create a competitive effect of more and more high quality urban development and urban regeneration projects that will, over the decades to come, reshape and redesign the face of urban New Zealand. So um, you might be wondering, well, why do we need, why do we need this law? Why do we need a, an agency like Kainga Ora to do this work? And the fact is that uh, urban regeneration, particularly on Brown and Greyfield sites, is intrinsically challenging and complex. You've often got a uh, great fragmentation of land title. You might have uh, old um, and uh, uh, out of date uh, infra network infrastructure like the pipes that carry the water under the ground. The roads might be in the wrong places. There might be parks and reserves that are in the wrong places and, and uh, are, are blocking a certain uh, development. Um, uh, there may be the RMA uh, plans, the zoning and, and rules in the local plan may not be conducive to development. Uh, and all of these things often add up to so much risk and uncertainty that the private sector cannot attempt uh, grey or brownfields development at scale. And so often it just doesn't happen. And so what we've tried to do with establishing Kainga Aura and was designing this new legislation, the Urban Development Bill, is to create an, an organisation and a set of powers that is able to cut through some of this complexity, to bring forward development projects that might otherwise take a decade to happen and allow them to happen much more quickly. And here's the really important thing, to deliver in the, in the final instance, much better urban outcomes stronger communities, a better built environment. And uh, I should also um, say that we've done this with, I think, a, a vision that is quite different to the way that this kind of work is often done uh, internationally. The, in Australia, I mentioned that in uh, places like New South Wales and Victoria, they've used urban development authorities to often redevelop old port land or old railway land and so on. The approach the Australians often take is to say, here's the land, here's the contract, knock yourself out. Go and stimulate the economy, create some jobs, and, uh, and then come back to us. Now, um, there's obviously uh, a role for urban development and stimulating the economy and creating jobs. But we, we see the really pressing need in New Zealand is to build our collective capability to build really fantastic communities that people will want to live and work and play in. And so um, the mandate and the vision for Kainga Ora 
to do these large scale urban projects is, um, is very strongly anchored in a vision of what's in the public good. So what does that mean? We want to see mixed use developments that include housing and, and, uh, and residential uh, and commercial developments. We want jobs to be close to where people live. We want these communities to be really well served by uh, transport infrastructure, including the kind of multimodal transport uh, that is Auckland's uh, future. We want really great walking and cycling neighbourhoods and be to be these communities to be connected to walking and cycling networks that crisscross the city. We want them to be within walking distance of, of high quality, frequent public transport and, and, and preferably rapid transit. So um, uh, we want these communities to have the best of urban design in their neighbourhoods and the spaces in between the buildings, we want to be friendly and safe and supportive of the kind of lives that people want to live. So um, that's, a, uh, I think, a very particular vision about what, ma what makes for strong communities and, uh, and successful uh, cities. So um, uh, what does the, the Urban Development uh, Bill say? It effectively brings together uh, in one organisation and in one piece of legislation, all of the powers that currently reside only with local government and that are currently scattered across numerous pieces of legislation um, or passed at all different times of our country's history uh, that often make um, it very difficult for local government to exercise all those powers in a streamlined uh, way. So, um, uh, uh, those, the kind of powers that I'm talking about are um, the uh, powers to reconfigure network infrastructure. So, uh, so Kainga Ora under this legislation, for instance, will be able to reconfigure the roads and the walking and cycling pathways. It will be able to redesign the, um, the pipes, the network of pipes that um, uh, distribute the three waters, water to the tap, storm water and wastewater. It will have the powers um, although, uh, I'll, and I'll come back to the sort of checks and balances that we put around it, but it will have the powers to reconfigure parks and reserves. We believe strongly that communities need public spaces and open spaces, access to streams and waterways and, um, and the natural environment. Um, so going Kaima Ora will have the ability to take all that into account as it um, shapes these new uh, developments. Um, it will have the, the ability to acquire land under the Public Works Act. Now, this is quite a sensitive and controversial issue, um, the use of the Public Works Act. In New Zealand, we habitually use the Public Works Act to acquire land um, for the building of roads and motorways. But we've never really had a history of using the Public Works Act to acquire land for urban development to build buildings let alone uh, new communities that include privately owned housing. So we haven't extended those powers. They've, already, they've always existed in New Zealand. Um, but, and in fact, we have put uh, some limits and controls around the exercise of uh, the acquisition of, of land for development projects. Um, but it is our, it's our firm belief that if you're going to do these kind of large scale developments, you must at least have those access to those powers of acquisition in your back pocket to avoid uh, people blocking developments in order to make a windfall gain. But it's my judgment, at least, that um, in New Zealand there would be very little tolerance or social license for the wholesale acquisition of privately owned land under the Public Works Act to support uh, urban development. Um, the, the new um, uh, act will also uh, give Kainga Ora, for the purpose of these um, large scale projects, it will give it the, the, the RMA, basically the RMA consenting powers, so that within the boundaries of a, what we call an, under the bill a specified development project, um, Kainga Ora will be able to um, redesign the zoning and the planning that currently would exist within the district plan or within Auckland's case, the Auckland Unitary Plan um, around the needs of the, um, of the uh, project. So that's a lot, um, that's a lot of powers in one place. 
And we're very conscious that these powers will need to be exercised with a great deal of responsibility and care. There are a number of checks and balances with these, um, uh, the exercise of these powers, uh, including um, that certain decisions have to be then ultimately signed off at cabinet level. So you've got that um, democratic accountability. Um, to give you an example, any exercise of these powers around the, the reconfiguration of parks and reserves ultimately gets signed off by the Minister of Conservation. Um, we've, put a, we've designed a, a, a process that um, uh, for the formulation and the development and the decision making around these large scale projects that was in part inspired by the, um, I think the success of Auckland Council in using an independent hearings panel to produce the Auckland uh, Unitary Plan. The, and uh, the key principles I think have been the front loading of public engagement right at the beginning of the process. Um, the ability for anybody to make a submission on a proposed plan and an independent hearings panel with environment court judge or retired environment court judges on it making those decisions and then appeals on um, matters of law and uh, judicial review. So um, very important to enshrine the public's right to have a say for all stakeholders and any public interest to want to be able to critique or, or make counter proposals uh, on a plan. Uh, and then ultimately you've got an experienced ju uh, judicial uh, uh, practitioner, if you like, on a panel that makes those decisions. Um, so that's, um, that's really um, the guts of it. And it's, it's our hope that uh, when passed into law in the next few weeks, this new legislation will be able to be used um, to, uh, to facilitate and support the implementation of a new generation of large scale uh, urban development projects. In designing the legislation, we have really um, put a great deal of emphasis on uh, these new powers and um, exercised by Kainga Ora as a, um, as a kind of uh, joint venture vehicle um, for partnerships to deliver these uh, urban development projects. It is, it is not our, our intention or our vision that government basically takes over the space of urban development, that central government um, does it all, takes over these projects and exercises these powers. Um, the legislation has been drafted so that, and we anticipate this will be probably more often than not, these large scale projects will be initiated and governed and implemented by, by partnerships that could include local government, um, local government development agencies like in Auckland, Panuku, uh, and others, private sector developers, iwi, uh, and others. And so uh, we want it to be an enabling uh, tool for all of those key development actors to do things. And I don't, I'm sure there'll be some where, where the government through Kainga Ora might, may lead um, particular developments, but I suspect a lot of them will be joint ventures with local councils. I know that there are many councils who are champing at the bit to use this legislation to undertake development projects. And I know that there are many in the private sector who also see this as a, as a real opportunity. So let me, um, let me uh, start to conclude by, by really just uh, putting the Urban Development um, Act or bill as it is now um, in, in the context and by mentioning some of the other things that are part of our uh, urban development agenda. So one of the first things that we did on becoming the government was really we realized that the, that the government really had very little capacity in this area um, of urban development. and so. Um, uh, I established the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development. So we brought bits of the public service that were scattered over multiple departments and ministries into one government ministry designed to provide central government leadership in the whole area of housing and urban development. We also then created Kainga Ora, the, um, the uh, agency that will exercise the special development powers we've been talking about. It's also inherited Housing New Zealand, their $25 billion asset base and the, the job of, of running New Zealand's state housing program. Um, and also into it has gone that what was the Hobsonville Land Company, HLC, 
and um, uh, the Kiwi Build procurement unit working with developers to get more affordable housing built. So that's the first thing, built the capacity of government. Secondly, we've, um, we're at also passing legislation uh, in the next few weeks to create new ways of funding and financing infrastructure. One of the reasons our towns struggle to grow is that councils can't borrow any more money to build the roads and the pipes, and therefore growth doesn't happen. That drives up the price of urban land and housing and blocks development. So we've brought on a new way of funding and financing infrastructure. Um, we are shortly to unveil a new national policy statement on urban development. Um, this is a, a policy instrument under the RMA, and it's the way that governments articulate the national interest and give guidance to councils. And our no national policy statement on urban development will do, um, amongst other things, will mandate councils to free up the planning rules around intensification and uh, require them to allow much more urban intensification, particularly in town centres, city centres, and along um, public transport routes and interchanges. It's also going to ban parking minima, that what's currently in many uh, New Zealand town plans is, um, uh, district plans, is uh, requirements for developers to put in, build so many car parks every time they build an apartment or a house or a, or a commercial uh, premises. And that's been, has a terribly distorting effect on urban land economics, drives up the price of housing and uh, undermines public transport. Um, we've also uh, been working on for the last couple of years on regional spatial planning partnerships with um, Tamaki Makoto, with Hamilton, the whole Waikato corridor, the Bay, Tauranga in the Bay of Plenty, uh, the Wellington region, Canterbury and uh, Queenstown. And these are partnerships between central government, uh, multiple councils, iwi, with a 30 year horizon planning, transport, housing, infrastructure and growth uh, and driving many of the things that I've been talking about this evening. More urban intensification, a more multimodal approach to transport investment, um, reform of the planning and zoning system. Um, RMA reform, my colleague David Parker has um, a full-throated reform of the RMA underway. Part of that is the urban side and um, some of the things that I've been talking about in the last 20 minutes really uh, will be reflected in, in the RMA reforms that will emerge over the next uh, year or so. And, um, uh, and then the, the final element really is a much uh, tougher integration of transport investment and planning with housing and uh, urban development. And um, you can see that in, in Wellington, let's get Wellington moving, our, $6.8 billion plan to build rapid transit, more walking and cycling uh, in Wellington City and create corridors where an urban development authority under the new legislation can um, deliver the kind of urban intensification in a rapid transit corridor. Same vision for light rail in Auckland, creating a corridor uh, of high frequency rapid transit uh, and then allowing quality urban intensification along that corridor. So just final comment, um, I, I think that the country is really ready for um, modernizing the way that we uh, grow our towns and cities. And my hope is that with the kind of reforms that I've been talking about tonight, including the new Urban Development Act, which will allow these large scale projects to proceed, that um, uh, it will generate a competitive effect. Towns and cities and will be competing to do inspiring um, development projects. Uh, and what it will do over the years to come is really reshape uh, our towns and cities for a more sustainable and inclusive and productive future. So Lee, thank you for patiently listening while all that was going on. And I, I look forward to questions. Well, thanks Phil, that was fantastic. I mean, there was just so many things that you've just gone through in such a short period of time. and I. We have a range of questions I'll, I'll get to in a moment, but just starting off, and I, a question I'd like to ask, and we were sort of discussing this before, is in light of where we've been and with the lockdown and everything like that, how do you see that as having an impact? And a lot of what you've talked about is, you know, Todd Oriento developments, intensification, and I would argue return to the local. How do you see the public's mood and how do you see that playing out in light of where we've been and what you're proposing now 
in the space we've been in the last couple of months? Um, oh, this is an interesting international debate that's going on right now and uh, about the future of cities in the, in the time of COVID. And uh, um, if I had to take a bet on it, Lee, I would say that the, the forces of urbanization, which are so powerful and have been going on for 150 years and have another 100 years to go um, in the estimates of a lot of thinkers in this area, I think those forces are so powerful. Um, I don't think that COVID, as large as it's looming in our consciousness right now, is going to set back or reverse that process of urbanization. I, I think we'll learn to live with these pandemics. Um, and, uh, but I think that they, yeah, I mean, I think that I, there was, uh, we were saying before we, we joined the Zoom um, lead that there was an interesting article in The Economist recently about whether mega cities like New York who have been so devastated by COVID-19, whether this will make people uh, reluctant to come into the city to work and to play and everything. And, and uh, um, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. But I, I think in New Zealand, if anything, it's, it's caused us to reflect on our neighbourhoods, on the kind of quality of life, um, and that's a good thing. And, uh, uh, and I, but uh, I, I think that the, the pressure and the imperative that we feel right now to build, a more, to build more successful cities, that people can move around freely, that are more prosperous, uh, where people have uh, quality, warm, dry, well-designed homes and neighbourhoods, access to jobs. Um, I think these are very powerful things that are, aren't going to go away. Just picking up the talk about the UDAs, and, and you talked about, obviously, the role of Kainga Ora and such like. Is the balance, and you talked about the balance sheet that Housing New Zealand has, is that part of their ability to finance the process, is using that balance sheet to finance that? So, I mean, um, people will know that our government's very strongly committed to public housing, um, state housing and working with community housing providers. We, it's, it's, it's really part of our DNA. And um, uh, Kainga Ora is already borrowing a lot of money against its balance sheet. And so um, in order to build, we just announced an, another 8,000 state houses that we're building at the moment. So we're working that balance sheet pretty hard um, so there isn't a lot of money hanging around to throw into these new large scale projects. And so, but we don't need the government to come with a war chest of money to do this all the time. Yep, sure. Time now and again, we've got to find money in the transport budget to build road or rail. You know, we just in January, we announced two and a half billion dollars for road and rail to allow a new town the size of Napier to be built at Drury around two railway stations. Mm -hmm. It's a great example of transit-oriented development actually on the edge of the city. But these people, when the city rail link's built, those people are gonna have uh, a half hour um, electric commuter train ride to the Britomart. Um, so yep, central government does have to be willing to fund things, but we also should bring in partners and Auckland Council and in Auckland, Auckland Council and Panuku are the obvious partners and they have a lot of land um, and, and assets. So one last question before I pass. So I've, just, I've got quite a few from the floor, which is fantastic. And please keep those coming through. Just in terms of how the actual UDA would actually work. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that it would take away those plan making, consenting and building consent powers from, from the council. So how does that relationship then work on the interface between the council and, and the UDA space? How does, how, how, would that, how does that play out and how does that work? So um, as in the process of developing uh, plans, the, um, the development entity that would be set up for a specific project, say, is required to consult with the council and others. Um, I expect that in, in, in many, uh, if not most cases, um, councils will be active partners in these new development projects. So they will be investors, developers, and will have seats on the boards of these entities. Uh, they will have the ability to do them themselves. Councils will have the ability to set up these projects and do them even without partners. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, and um, there are various uh, checks and balances that are built into the, the process of developing and agreeing a project uh, plan um, that require councils to be um, consulted and their views taken into account. I'll give you one example. 
um, if the if a, one of these urban development entities was to uh, redesign the the network infrastructure, the let's say the three waters for a project, it would not be fair or reasonable for them to design that in a certain way that didn't fit the wider network that the council runs, and then at the end of the project, hand those pipes back to the council in a way that that they might be of inferior quality or alternatively gold plated and too expensive. So there are, there are uh, we've designed into the legislation the necessity for those things to be kind of worked out to a mutual agreement. But it's true, it's truly that the, these entities will have the ability to, to rewrite the zoning rules, for instance, to allow for more intensification or more height in a particular area that might vary from the district plan. Well, I think I'll take a question from the floor, and we've got here from one from Ben Van Bergen. He says, in many examples you've mentioned in many countries, there's a strong urban design legislation and government champions for good design. We have governments with, you know, design departments. Mm. When will we see New Zealand, when we will see central government's design quality unit established in New Zealand? And I think, uh, I think the UDF, as I put my head up, has uh, been a member of the Urban Design Forum. I'm sure we've, we've hassled you about this before. So any more thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, Ben and many other colleagues have been very good advocates on this issue. And um, I'm the first to admit that uh, our reforms in this first three year period have been very much focused on building institutional capacity, trying to create a legislative framework for more urban development and, 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 uh, and addressing the kind of supply and demand aspects of, the, of um, the urban land market and housing market. Because I think that's what needed to be done in the first instance. But I absolutely recognize that um, if we if we want to look back in, you know, 20 years time or 30 years time and say, hey, we made a difference uh, when we did all these reforms and together, government, councils, community, the design provisions, we really lifted New Zealand's game on the way we build our cities, then design is central to it. We've got to build homes that in 50 years time or 100 years time, people will be proud to live in that are healthy and, um, and uh, give people the kind of lifestyle they want. We've got to have good, really great transport infrastructure. We want to reduce carbon emissions. We want people to have access to open spaces. Um, we want buildings that are really well designed and functional and beautiful. Mm. So I think there's a great debate to be had and I think we've started having it about how you engender a, a better design sensibility uh, when it comes to the built environment. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of very open to the next phase really of reforms looking at what we might do. And it may be legislation, there may be some policy instrument, it may be that we need people in Kainga Ora and the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development who champion good design and are kind of the guardians and the advocates for design. Um, I haven't been able to kind of get to that stuff in this first three year period because we've had a very, very busy agenda, but I, um, I don't need much convincing that it's, um, that it's a good idea. And I think you can see in Auckland Council, the Auckland Design Office over a certain period of time, it really raised the public debate around mm. design, the use of design panels, a lot of good public advocacy, um, some real success stories there, and I think that we can learn um, from that. All right, we've got a question, anonymous, been a bit unfortunate, but attempts to increase quality um, of housing has so far somewhat been lacklustre, and there's been little change in housing affordability. Are there any other means by which you see us being able to change our society's views on housing as mm -hmm. something that is interesting really increases the value despite its utility to the own, well, basically, I've, talking about value capture and value increase of housing is basically what he's talking yeah. about. And you know what I'm saying? So I do. what do you think about that? Well, um, I think we have made some progress on this. Um, our government has uh, nailed its colours to the mast very strongly on uh, wanting to address housing affordability. We have um, built, um, in the last three years, we've built more uh, public housing than the last national government did over nine years. In fact, they reduced, if they had built at the same rate we are, there would no, be no shortage of housing, state housing, there'd be no waiting list. So we've done that. We um, have banned foreign buyers from buying New Zealand homes and bidding up the price of New Zealand homes. 
we've shut down the tax breaks for property investors that fueled the kind of Ponzi scheme of housing uh, that we saw at the top of the cycle uh, more recently. So um, we've done those things. Um, we've had some very well publicized um, difficulties with Kiwi Build, um, which you know I was at the forefront of, and it took a lot of, um, I should say, a lot of uh, hide off my back, really um, struggling with that policy, which was a, you know, a genuine attempt to try to work with the private sector to get the private sector to build more affordable homes instead of the traditional New Zealand business model, which is to drip feed more mm. expensive high-end homes into the market. Now, um, we gave away the, uh, the, the, those huge ambitious targets for Kiwi Build, but we have continued with the program and my colleague Megan Woods uh, has continued to, to do that and we, we won't stop doing that. But, but the reason that I, I've talked a lot about tonight about the urban development policy settings, this is absolutely critical because government, and like, government will never build the houses, all the houses that we need, it's not possible. We, re, we must rely on the private sector to build the great majority of houses. Uh, and but we need the policy settings that will create a market that actually works. That's why we've put a lot of energy into um, bringing new ways of financing infrastructure um, to the market. It's why we're freeing up the planning rules through the national policy statement and through reform of the RMA. And um, uh, and it's why we're bringing transport infrastructure much more to the centre of urban planning. All of those things will allow more and better homes to be built. Put that together with the urban development legislation. We can do more large scale projects, building at scale, you know, communities of five, 10, 20,000 new homes and well-planned new communities. It's a, it's a multi-pronged reform agenda that if we follow it through, will create the conditions where we don't have this terrible cycle of housing shortages and obscenely expensive um, of housing. Just, just picking up the issue of the RMA reform, which you touched on, what sort of parts and things were you thinking in terms of RMA reform? I know that Justice Randerson's engaged in yeah. his reform and that's been engaged by your colleague, uh, the Minister for the Environment, but what sort of ideas as a government do you have in terms of those reforms? So I can only speak, Lee, to the urban dimension. So the RMA is obviously much bigger um, mm. than uh, uh, the built environment, but let me, let me focus on, on that. Um, and so many of the things that I've spoken about tonight that underpin our urban policy will be reflected in the proposals that I think you'll see coming out of the, the reform process. So for example, um, the, uh, this approach to spatial planning, mm. which is really about, uh, uh, it's highly collaborative. So it's not just councils doing it, it's got to involve iwi, it's got to involve the private sector and the wider community. And it's a break with the approach, the, the dominant approach under the RMA for the last 30 years, which was essentially based on the notion, let the market do whatever it wants and mitigate the effects of it. It treats development uh, as kind of a bad thing that has costs or imposes externalities and says, let's mitigate them and negotiate around the edges. Mm. In our view, urban development's a good thing. We need more of it. We've got to embrace growth and choose the kind of growth that we want. So um, this uh, spatial planning approach to urban growth is a very different approach. And, um, and I, I hope that you'll see that coming through um, the RMA uh, reforms. I mean, I think that's a really good point. You know, you look at those first and second generation district plans and they, where did they talk about the positive benefit of urbanism and all that sort of stuff. I think that's a really good point. Um, another anonymous, um, attendee says, thank you very much, Phil. Um, could you advise, have you been any consultation with the youth and the younger population on the urban development, um, urban development bill, considering they are the future occupiers and shapers of our cities, which is a good quote. Very good question, yeah. Um, so we put the, the Kainga Aura legislation uh, and the um, urban development, the, the Kainga Aura legislation was established in the um, yeah, agency. Then the Urban Development Bill have gone through full uh, select committee processes uh, and uh, they also went through kind of a lot of stakeholder consultation in the design phase. And the National Policy Statement on Urban Development also has been uh, widely consulted around the country and has gone through a full consultation. And actually, 
I would say that um, groups like Generation Zero, who are our kind of youth voice on um, sustainability issues and are very active around the built environment, transport, housing, and so on. Uh, in, all, in all of those cases, Generation Zero have been pretty active. Um, but I wouldn't claim that um, uh, it's been uh, uh, some kind of model or success story um, of youth engagement. Um, right across politics, I think that's one of the big challenges that, that we have and we've got to do it better. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a really important point uh, to thank you very much. Just picking up here, I've got something from Alistair Ray. Um, you've hit the nail on the head. All the many and varied reasons for housing affordability issues. Biggest by far is that we treat housing and the buying of land as an investment and many more, many more than the other reasons. This is a big problem. How do you address this particular issue? I suppose that's the whole issue about how we treat investment. We treat housing as our number one primary investment, don't we? It is. It is. Um, so there's a couple of um, angles on this. So one is about is around um, uh, tax. Tax treatment is very important, and um, uh, and that's why we, um, for instance, um, shut down the the tax breaks that were have been in the system for the last uh, thirty or years or more, that allowed negative gearing, that allowed property investors to uh, write off their losses on one property against uh, other business activity. Um, and we pushed out the, um, the uh, uh, from five years to 10 years, the, um, um, the so-called bright line uh, treatment so that if you sell a rental property um, within 10 years, then you, no, sorry, from two years to five years, I beg your pardon. Mm. Um, if you sell that property within the five years, then you pay um, income tax on all of the profit that you make. Um, so those are two important changes. Um, uh, the, on the other side, the, the um, supply side, a lot of our agenda really has been about trying to make sure that um, the market can respond to demand. What makes uh, property speculation such a lucrative um, business in New Zealand for much of the time is that our market doesn't properly respond to demand. Demand outstrips supply uh, and uh, house prices go up. And the people who bet on those changes are the property speculators. They make a killing at the expense of every other person's housing costs in New Zealand. It's the same with um, land bankers. Um, the urban containment model of town planning creates a boundary where the land on the urban side of that boundary can sometimes be up to 10 times the value of the rural land that cannot be developed for housing. And what land bankers do is they, they take a bet on when the boundary will be pushed out and they make often massive, massive returns at the cost of everybody else. Now, if we can grow our cities in a much more expansive way, up and out, but only with good infrastructure, then um, the market will meet the demand and it will chip away at the business model of the speculators. And that is, I believe, that is the long-term answer. I mean, I suppose that's the interesting question about when you do that evaluation between the things, what's the value of the rural land without the infrastructure? And I suppose that's the point you're making, isn't it? Um, I've got a question here. I'm going to slightly go to tech here, but I've got a question here from Caroline, who's um, great to see someone from Hamilton's actually um, um, watching us today. So compulsory acquisition, I live in Hamilton, where the subdivision pattern of the sea was fundamentally established in the 1960s through to the 80s. Impossible to for comprehensive, impossible for comprehensive urban intensification. How gutsy is Kaying Aura going to be with its compulsory powers? That's a good question. Very thank good. you for from Hamilton. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. Um, actually, let me say first that uh, I'm actually really excited by the work that we've been doing, not only with Hamilton City Council, but with Waikato Tainui, with Waipa District Council, uh, Waikato District, um, Waikato Regional Councils. Well, we, we've done this um, pretty amazing Hamilton Waikato Metro spatial plan that involves quite radical intensification um, reforms to the zoning uh, in Hamilton, the building of a rapid transit network using the existing heavy rail um, network, not only servicing a lot of the key employment and, and housing uh, nodes in Hamilton, the existing Hamilton city, but going out to Te Aumutu, to Morrinsville, 
to Cambridge, up to Narawahia. So you get this radial uh, set of corridors, which are fantastic for Hamilton's future growth. Um, and so that is a, that's a very, very big shift away from the traditional development pattern that we've seen in places like Hamilton and Tauranga, low rise suburban expansion and lots of motorways. So um, I'm, I think that's very, very promising. And, uh, and the councils there have shown their, um, their willingness to embrace these reforms. I don't see us using compulsory acquisition to go and you know, forcibly acquire a whole lot of urban land and then redevelop it. But I think there are some interesting examples around the world of cities that have facilitated through zoning reform and transport investments have facilitated the second generation growth that encourages incumbent landowners to um, redevelop their properties and, and shift, for example, to you know, uh, duplexes or uh, three-story apartments and away from that low rise. So I think you'll see lots of that in, in New Zealand cities, including Hamilton. You'll also see uh, much more ambitious urban intensification in the city centres and, and then also in town centres around uh, rapid transit and railway stations. I've got a question here from Morton, which I think is a really interesting one, and that's I'm just paraphrasing what he's saying. He's talking about, have you and your colleagues thought about establishing the cooperative housing model? Um, and give some a few of those Nordic examples. Yep. Yeah, thanks for that, Morton. Um, I'm, I, have to, I have to be brutally honest with you and, and, and say that in the last two and a half years or three years in government, we haven't um, done this. But it's clear to me that there is lots of potential here. If we want to grow a more kind of diverse and innovative housing ecosystem, that co-housing or cooperative housing uh, could have a really interesting and positive role to play. Um, I was in Dunedin recently where there's a co-housing association who took over an old primary school right in the town in Dunedin. And they've reworked it uh, and they, they are building, I think they've got more than 20 two-story townhouses uh, built to passive house standards in a fantastic development there, right in the heart of Dunedin, using a co-housing model. And there are a number of others around the country. Um, Earth Song, which is one of the um, well-established co-housing uh, co uh, operations, is in my electorate in West Auckland. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot that we can learn from what is really an international movement. It's got a great heritage in Scandinavia, but a number of other countries around the world are dealing with this and uh, we, could, we, we could do well to allow these, some of these models to flourish here. Because I mean, that sort of leads onto the whole land tenure model, doesn't it? And the way that we finance um, development or finance housing, because being involved in the one in Greyland as the commissioner, I found it was a very, very interesting model that they're running there and the problems that they ran into and, and just dealing with the Unit Tiles Act. And is that something that the government would be looking at, changing those tenure models to make these sort of things more, more, you know, more easy to attain, if you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I hope um, in the next term of government, if we're lucky enough to be re-elected, we will look at um, modernising the Unit Titles Act Mm. Just, just for more apartment living, mm. it's essential that we modernise that legislation. Um, but I think we could also look at some of those other models, Lee, to try and make it easier for people to do, um, you know, models like, uh, you know, in, the, in North America, where they talk about cooperative housing mm. or co-ops, it's not, it has a different connotation to Scandinavian co-housing. In the States, it often just means um, a bunch of what we would call apartments or flats mm. on a shared piece of land, sometimes with some common facilities. Um, now, if we, can, if we can find ways to allow people in our cities to build the kind of homes they want in the places where they want to live, where the land cost is less because there's more density or it's, um, you've got a number of units and one sharing uh, a single title, then um, we're going to be giving people better housing choices and ultimately, if there's enough of it happening, it will bring down the price of housing because you'll have more housing and more development opportunities available for people. Thank you. One question from Mustafa. How does the new bill help the SDG to 2030 goals? Yeah, so um, the, I, the notion of sustainability 
and uh, both social and economic and environmental is is at the heart of this uh, agenda. Um, and we talk about um, the values that we talk about for our government and our economic plan for New Zealand is about building a more sustainable, inclusive and productive New Zealand. Um, and so at the heart of our vision is in terms of social sustainability is really um, uh, ensuring that ha New Zealanders can be decently housed uh, and have access to um, good quality uh, housing that they can afford in places where they want to live. Um, the uh, kainga aura and exercising the powers under the Urban Development Act has to um, uh, give appropriate consideration to our, the overriding imperative that our government has to reduce carbon emissions. And so, you know, building whole new communities that have access to rapid transit and public transport is really important. And uh, I, the, the vision that I see is that in many of these new communities, um, the way you won't have, like in the old days, uh, any some sort of mandatory requirement that you have one or two car parks in your apartment. If you want to have a car park, you'll be able to buy it or lease it separately. Or better still, you'll have access to um, uh, ride sharing services in your community and great walking and cycling infrastructure and walkable access to, to, to frequent public transport. And that those things will, um, it will help us to realize the potential that cities have for a much smaller carbon footprint. Because I mean, just picking up that point, there was some work done by some colleagues at Massey University that told that if we kept housing size, existing construction techniques, and you've probably seen this, and then life cycle things, that if we didn't change that, we would exceed our Paris obligations by five times. And so what's happening in that construction sector to deal with those sort of sustainability issues? Yeah, so alongside the work that, um, that I'm doing in transport to reduce our carbon emissions by, you know, electrifying the vehicle fleet and so on and so forth, um, in the built environment, we know that, um, that it's responsible for about, I think, 17% of our carbon emissions. So we've got the potential here to um, really make some gains. My colleague, Jenny Salesa, who's the Minister of Building and Construction, she recently launched a, a program of work which is about reducing carbon emissions in, in construction processes um, and, uh, and reforms to the Building Act and the Building Code that will set higher standards for thermal efficiency and reduce not only in, in terms of the production processes and, um, uh, and building materials, but also the embodied carbon content of, of our buildings. So that's really important uh, work. And um, I'm, as Economic Development Minister, I'm also responsible for government procurement. Now the government spends, you know, $42 billion a year buying goods and services, and we, we build a lot of things, build a lot of buildings. So I'm very interested in how we can um, require and incentivize government agencies to build the lowest carbon option and use materials and processes to ensure that we're reducing the carbon footprint of our buildings. So there's a couple of things, but we've got a long way to go on this. Well, I think we've got time for just one last question. And I think I'll take this one from Julie Stout. She'll kill me if I don't take it. <laughs> and the question's to do with, um, do you believe that the latest report out today on the port relocation takes into account the transformational changes possible, as you've outlined in shifting the port, just not for Auckland, but also unlocking the economic employment and growth for Northland? Yeah. So, Julie, I'm as, um, as Transport Minister, um, I am particularly focused, as you might have heard in my public comments today, and as we think about the future of the ports of Auckland, um, we have to recognise that um, the ports of Auckland cannot continue in its current location for, for longer than about 30 years. That's the most generous estimate, probably less than that. We have a window of about 10 to 15 years to make a decision and prepare for um, uh, a new configuration of the, up, the ports of the Upper North Island that bring in most of our country's imports and send most of our exports out to the world. And I'm uh, very focused on ensuring that we make what is a quite a complex decision that will cost us as a country billions of dollars uh, in the sort of investment in, um, in uh, the infrastructure. 
that we make that on the basis of what will give us a really efficient supply chain for our economy, exports and imports, um, but also what is environmentally sustainable. And, uh, and I'm determined that we will um, work through this decision um, on, the, on, the, on those two factors uh, on the basis of a really rigorous and sound evidence base. Um, I think it will be uh, also, it's a very happy um, co-benefit for Auckland that um, as, as the port has moved out of that central city location, there will be an amazing opportunity to um, redevelop, regenerate um, uh, what is part of the heart of Auckland in an amazing waterfront setting. And you never know, maybe the Urban Development Act and its provisions for large scale complex urban regeneration will assist in that, in that task. Thank you, we've come around to time and we can't take any more of your, your time, um, Minister and Phil. I'd just like to thank you very much for making the time and your support for the school and the university. Thank you very much for a very candid and very uh, insightful conversation and it's always good to talk to you and thanks very much for your time and um, thanks very much. It's thanks great to see you again. Thank you. And I'd just like to say a thank you to everyone, all the participants in the Fast Forward series. Unfortunately, that's the winter series coming to an end. Uh, we managed to get some stuff back online with Zoom and I'd just like to say thank Neve, Lynette and Brent for all their hard work in, in making that happen. We'll be back in spring um, with someone else will be running the program for you. Um, but the questions will be whether we're online or in face, we're still making that decision. We might be on Zoom because I think that's quite um, helpful. A lot of people can engage in that way. So. On that note, thanks very much for everyone who's engaged. Thanks for your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to them all tonight. It's great to have you here and thanks very much for your time and have a good night. Thank you.